Thank you very much for inviting me here. I think I'm the exotic part in this round because um, with all these fantastic institutions which we already have been introduced to and which I know, of course, for a long time, my background was the art world, or still the art world. I got involved with the digital arts about 30 years ago, just by chance, on a trip to Florida, and I got excited. And that hasn't stopped. Because can you imagine such a conference on painting? No, that's not possible. I mean, definitely, I totally agree. The virtual, the digital is going to affect our century the most. And it would, has influenced our society already to such a large degree, it will get even worse or better. We will see. Anyway. I will have a quick look at the history of digital art because that was that I was majorly involved with them from the beginning when I started. Because the purpose was when I started this online museum um, to make people aware of the history of it. In the 80s and 90s, basically beside Ars Electronica and SIGGRAPH, there was nothing really of major influence happening in the art world, in the digital art world. SIGGRAPH was a place to meet in the US, Electronica was a place to meet in Linz, and you, all, you could meet all the fantastic people which were the early pioneers. But when I started to talk to museum directors or uh, curators, they looked at me strange. Computer? No, please, um, leave it. And there was already fantastic art around. To start with, I will, I'm starting with a quote which I just recently found, which I find very interesting because it has still a lot to do with our times. It is from Professor Dennis Garber and it is from 1960. Will the machine cut out the creative artist? And we are getting back to what you just said. I sincerely hope that ma machines will never replace the creative artists, but in good conscience, I cannot say that they never could. And I would add, that is a question I still cannot answer because it's very much discussed in the contemporary times, even 60 years later. But we will see what AI and GAN and machine learning will show to us. So let's start at the beginning. Basically, as the early computer arts started in the 60s, and I give you a quick run through some major artists from that time so you have some background, what you just heard before, on the very contemporary movements. The first person you see up here on the picture is Frieda Nake. He was one of the three pioneers of digital art who had the first documented shows in the gallery in 1965. Frieda Nake is still in his middle 80s. He he's teaching since forever. I think he had his hundredth semester. He's thinking about stopping now. That doesn't mean he's stopping working. He's thinking about teaching at the, as a professor in the university. He's still producing art. And uh, I think he's one of the few early, early, early pioneers who, who is the most fascinating. The reason is most of these artists, and I'll show you some work from him, most of these artists of the early days, they were basically scientists. Frida, uh, was educated as a mathematician. He was not educated as an artist at all. And many of these other, the other three in 1965 were Georg Nees and Michael A. Noll. They all came from a, from a scientific background. But the difference with Frieda is he was really very creative about it. If you look at the early digital art, um, there are topics which are reappearing again because they're quite obvious. But he experimented with different forms and very new approaches at the time in a very broad scale, which really showed, uh, which really resulted in him being really very much collected even now, even more than before. This is probably his most well-known piece. Everybody who is into digital art will probably know it, but it has been published loads of times. It's called Homage à Paul Klee. And he actually had an 
interactive piece created in 2005, which he showed at uh, the gallery of mine in Berlin. I'm not sure if I made it very clear. Yes, DAM is an online museum. I didn't say it really. Uh, it started in, it was created in 98, but it went online in 2000. And the idea, as I already mentioned, was to show the history of it. And then I continued to open a gallery in Berlin in 2003, which is basically funding everything. It's still a private activity. We are funding everything with getting people excited about digital art and do events, do talks and so on in Berlin and try to um, excite collectors about this kind of art. Then there was the end of the 60s and 1970s and the first, and there are basically two major artists who had an artistic background, got involved in digital art and one of the, of the few women was and still is, she's now 98 years old, still active. By the way, she's on the Biennale. The first time she's on the Biennale in Venice, representing her early pieces, Vera Molna. She has become a very influential artist in this field. And I think she, is, she has grown more successful the last years than ever which I think is the best that, that, that can happen when you get old, you know? Every year something comes on top. When I told her about the Biennale in Venice, that was about uh, two years ago, she said, too late. That's her humor. All right, very typical piece of hers, hyper-transformation from the 70s, where she deconstructed squares Another very famous series called Desordres. It basically explains it. She varies this kind of. And then later on in the 80s, the series of squares. The other major artist from that period who had an artistic background is Manfred Moore. He is 15 years younger than her. But the funny part is they both started in Paris. She came from Hungary, moved to Paris after the war and lived in Paris. He came, well, he was, he's still German, but he lived in Barcelona at the time, was a musician, a jazz musician. And then he moved to Paris as well. And both got involved with digital art at the same time. They are still discussing who was first. I'm not gonna get involved because that was really a touchy part. But I think Vera Molna was a little bit earlier, half a year, maybe. Um, so they both started, their approach was very different. Vera Molna is much more playful. She's much more, comes much more from an aesthetic end. Manfred Moore is very puristic. At the beginning, he tested some different, oh, that's a bit small, sorry for that. Um, he tested some different approaches, but since the middle 70s, he only works with squares. Well, actually, precisely cubes, the three-dimensional cube. And he actually computed them into mathematically 13 dimensions. Well, I'm not gonna get into that too much right now because that goes a bit far, but this is an example of the 70s where you still can see this reference, but all this later work, and this is now after 2000, um, is based on the cube concept and is nothing than lines and this flat surfaces. Inter interesting with him is as well that his um, programs, which he all, of course, they all, all these pioneers wrote their own programs. They had to teach themselves most of the time to learn programming and then they wrote their own programs to produce their art. And Manfred um, did, uh, made the step in 2000 that he actually produced real-time software, which means the program he wrote, you could see as well on a screen as a real-time moving software, continuously changing. Vera Moll never, never did that. She worked in series and uh, still does and stayed on this level. But since 2000, Manfred basically produces a software piece and some pictures around it, which are documenting it as well. 
By the way, the crooked lines come from the movement of the square. So you might wonder where that is coming from because that was a new invention by him. Then there are some artists, and I think from my experience, I still discover new artists, but very rarely. But from, there are, from the first 40 years, there are probably not more than 10 who have really developed a kind of own language and an own aesthetics and been able to pursue that over 30, 40 years. Even so, they, I think all of them never really made much money. I mean, Manfred and Vera, they start selling because they were somehow integrated in the field of construct constructivist art and they transferred their concepts to canvases, which was a kind of compromise for the art market. But um, on the purely digital field, the market was very, very, very small, I can tell you. So this is Jean-Pierre Hébert. He passed away last year, a very interesting position, because he went to the extreme. At that time, you could produce the, or the, at the beginning stages, it was the only possibility to produce a uh, materialistic, uh, an output on paper was a pen plotter drawing, which means actually a pen was driven by the computer. And he went to deliver it and produce this kind of work in a way, it's very, very, very detailed. There are larger sizes and the plotter was running without interruptions for three, four, up to a week. So he had to fill in ink and so on and pursue the, and basically supervise it all this time. Another position who has started as well in the 70s and 80s is Mark Wilson. You see, some, you see him here with his wife. Um, you see some later work in front of him, he developed a very own style, as you can see. Oh, no, that's the wrong one. Okay. Okay. Well, maybe they are appearing again, I don't know, but the pieces of Mark Wilson are missing. So I will continue and will, if there was the change was because what we see here is another artist whose name is Roman Verosco. He's in his middle 90s now as well. Started in the 70s again. These are all pawn plotter drawings. He had a very much... Yeah, that is a bit of an unusual approach because he used the pen plotter as well to put brushes in. So with every movement which was programmed, because of what you see as the little black signs, they are each movement the pen plotter did, all added together, would result in this kind of gouache, you would call it. Now I come to an artist um, who is a, very much different to all the others I talked about. They had all of... Um, an abstract approach in working with a computer. Harold Cohen had the vision already in the 70s to develop an AI, to develop an artificial intelligence which produces art every day based on his programming. So he would come into his studio, and when I met him, that was around 2000, he would come into the studio in the morning, he would check out what the AI has done, sort out the the pictures which were interesting enough, and delete the others. And he put up this vision that that would continue as well once he would pass away, which he did already some years ago. It actually didn't work. The computer stopped and the program stopped. But um, the other aspect was with him that he had a figurative approach. So these are early drawings from the 80s. You can see it's a totally different aesthetics. And with the shading and so on, he tried to develop a space. He programmed his algorithms in a way that it really could develop into something fig figurative, which he later then resulted in something like that after 2000. Ah, here we go. This is the picture from Roman Verosco, which we saw the pieces earlier on. And now we have the artwork of Mark Wilson. Sorry for that. 
Um, Mark Wilson, which you saw with his wife, um, is as well an early pioneer. Which will which will we will show in Berlin uh, in fall. Now we are coming to the so-called net art, which was a very exciting movement. Has some parallels to what when we talk about democratization of art and digital art in the 90s. Artists could produce their work without a curator, without a gallerist, without anybody, and put it online and reach their di directly their public, which was really exciting. And uh, there was so much fantastic stuff online. And um, Mukotsic, what you see here, is one of the ones, artists who got famous at that time, who coined the term net art as well. But, of course, you couldn't sell this kind of work. It was a website. which has changed as well. Okay, uh, that was too quick. Okay. okay. Nearly. Okay. okay. <laughs> it will not be long. Um, this is an example of Jody. That's a couple which was became famous as well with the net art movement. They produced websites which played with the usual perception of websites. For example, you couldn't handle the mouse anymore. They'd moved around and uh, the website became totally independent what it produced. Olia Lia Lina, which is a famous piece of hers. And then basically, and then I'm coming to the end, um, after 2000, a very influential artist, and uh, that is Casey Reese, who you see here, who has created a lot around software art, and he even developed into movement. He produced his own software language processing in 2000, which is taught all over the world. He has become a very influential artist as well, now with the NF NFT movement. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Wolf. Thank you very much. Very, very interesting presentation.